Mr. Bill Boyd, Western Washington University class of 1982. Those of you that class, I had just learned this morning, he actually was known then as Wild Bill, <laughs> is your commencement speaker. A 25-year firefighter, Mr. Boyd has been a real-life hero, ready to help save a life whenever the need arose. Now chief of the Bellingham Fire Department, Mr. Boyd insists that his crew members are the real heroes, not just because they run into burning buildings. As chief, he's proud that despite terrible budget times, he's able to keep his 160-member department well-equipped and ready for whatever may eventuate. He's even prouder of his crew's exceptional safety record. No Bellingham Fire Department employee has been seriously injured or killed since he started as chief in 2003. Mr. Boyd is a graduate of the National Fire Academy Executive Fire Officer Program and is part of a regional incident management team. A thought leader in the field of social media in emergency management, he consults and lectures for the Department of Homeland Security on communication and social media. Mr. Boyd is an avid supporter of Western and is immediate past president of the Alumni Association. Today, his son Evan, also a firefighter, earns his communication degree. It gives me great pleasure to introduce your commencement speaker, Mr. Bill Boyd. I just told Bruce I will get even. <laughs> Thank you, this is a great honor. Trustees, President Shepard, faculty, family, graduates. I'm very humbled by this honor. Hey, class of 2011, you feeling good? No, 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 you feeling good? You should be, you earned it. Parents, how about you? You guys feeling good? You should be, we paid for it. I have to tell you, I am a tad bit nervous, not because I stick out like a sore thumb in this uniform, um, and it's not because I'm speaking to such a large group or having such a large presence behind me with President Shepard and the trustees. Um, I've spoken to larger groups than this, and um, this is probably, the, in fact, I know this is the first time that a firefighter has given a keynote to commence the speech at Western, which is pretty cool. But that's not why I'm nervous. I'm nervous because I can't use PowerPoint. <laughs> I am a government official, okay? We're supposed to be using PowerPoint. It's like a firefighter fighting a fire without a hose, but I'm gonna give it my best shot and we'll see what happens. Having spent a quarter century, over a quarter century serving this community, I have seen and experienced a lot. Now, I'm not gonna go all philosophical on you guys. You've heard enough. Um, and in fact, most of you are not gonna remember anything I say here today. In a few years, you won't even know who I am. There's only a couple things I remember about my graduation. I'm just sitting out there like you guys. Number one, it was really hot, and I was glad I was wearing shorts. And two, I had a keg that I needed to return to the Up and Up Tavern. <laughs> and it got left in the back of my car. But I digress here. In fact, I am going to get a little bit philosophical with you. And, um, but I think it'll be from what you would hopefully consider a unique perspective. Knowing many of you just want to get out of here, I'm going to press on and tell you four things I want you to do once you walk out of here with the hopes at least one of them will stick. If you take any of this to heart, after 30 years, perhaps you can stand in front of an esteemed group such as this and talk about how you made a difference. First thing I want you to do is be a hero. I work in a profession that's often viewed as heroic. The common perception of firefighters is that we must be nuts to run into burning buildings when everybody else is running out. While somewhat true, Public perception is changing with a lingering economic mess and criticism of government officials in general. It's unfortunate and a sad commentary on our current state of affairs, and I won't get into it further. But my folks are heroes, sometimes performing their jobs at great peril and with unwavering skill. But this is what the public expects when they are having their worst day. But I'm going to submit to you that's not what makes them heroes. They, and they'd be quick to tell you they're just doing their jobs. I have a higher and more worthy view of what makes them heroes. Let me tell you a story. A few years ago, a man stopped by one of our fire stations to visit. 
His name was Charlie Corston, and perhaps a dozen years earlier, firefighters and paramedics had saved his life when his heart quit. Our guys look forward to hearing his stories of life, love, and loss, and he craved the attention. During one of the chats, he mentioned that he was struggling with a medical issue, and because he could not drive, was trying to figure out how to get to Seattle for weekly treatments. Without Charlie knowing, a small group of my guys banded together and committed to drive him to Seattle and back every week for medical treatments. For two years, they gave their valuable time and invaluable love to take care of this old man. He lived for several more years, but eventually passed away. These same firefighters served as pallbearers at his funeral. Heroes. Does this fit your, your hero image of a firefighter? I doubt it. Does it fit your definition of heroism? It should. Looking up the definition of a hero getting ready for the speech, I found a term paper based on David Bren's post-apocalyptic novel, The Postman. While describing the main character in the novel, the author of the term paper nailed my perception of a hero. Qualities present in heroes often include strong ethics, high moral standards, and self-sacrifice for the well-being of others. Western recently adopted a new model, Active Minds Changing Lives. In the hero context, this saying can and perhaps should be changed to mean working hard, helping others. I challenge each of you to tap into your inner hero, work hard, help others. Task number two, take chances. Lots of commence, commencement speakers stand up here and talk about the pursuit of greatness, building leaders, or giving back to the university, which is a really good idea, by the way, and I'm gonna tell you about that later. <laughs> but I'm gonna be contrarian. I want you to fail. Yep, you heard me right. I'm using the four-letter word of commencement speeches. Flame out, auger in, buy the farm, crash and burn, flunk, waste, implode, wash out, or wreck. You could probably come up with some more, and we probably can't use them. You know, gotta be politically correct. All of these terms define failure, and often failure is a really big deal with really big consequences. But most of the time, all failure means is you gave something your best shot, and it didn't work out. Everyone fails at something. We fail at observing the speed limit, balancing our checkbook. Does anybody carry a checkbook anymore? <laughs> fail in love, fail on our job, fail to lose weight. But I'm here to tell you, you need to push the edge of your envelope. Suck it up. Be courageous. Think outside the box and go for it. Will you succeed? Maybe. Maybe not. But you'll never know if you don't try. The great philosopher Conan O'Brien <laughs> gave Dartmouth's uh, spring commencement speech this year. Okay, you know, he is a pretty funny guy, and if you don't follow him on Twitter, you should. But surprisingly, he got all serious at one point and noted, there are few things more liberating in this life than having your worst fear realized. Whether you fear it or not, true disappointment will come. But with disappointment comes clarity, conviction, and true originality. Here's hoping your future failures bring you clarity, conviction, and originality. Task number three, realize nothing is forever. Now, I'm gonna go all morbid on you here. Um, just indulge me briefly, cause, and I get this, I come by this naturally, because my dad was a mortician, <laughs> and given this in my profession, I have seen more than my share of end of life stories. But understanding that we are here for only a short period of time is extremely important. About two months ago, the Western family lost a faculty member, Dr. Ethan Remmel. Dr. Remmel was a highly respected associate professor of developmental psychology, and he passed away from cancer in June. And I'm guessing some of you out here may have had Dr. Remmel for a class. And in fact, he taught his last class only 10 days before he died. Now, I never knew Ethan, but I came to know a little bit about him after he died. You see, once he learned his condition was terminal, 
he started a blog and began to write. And he began to write about his end of life journey. The blog was called Living While Dying, and it was published by Psychology Today and inspired readers around the world with his thoughts, grace, and clarity about the finality of life and how to live it. He never stopped teaching. In one of his posts, Ethan wrote, the key to dying well is living as long as possible. By teaching right up until the end, Ethan showed what it was like to really live life. By accepting a fate that was coming way too soon, he realized he still had control over his quality of life in the time he had left and made choices to live it to the fullest. In 2005, Steve Jobs, you know, the Apple guy, spoke at Stanford University's commencement. At the time, he had completed treatment for cancer and wanted to share some of what he learned, saying, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of someone else's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drive out, drive out, drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. So I ask you graduates, how much time do you have left? If you knew, what would you do? How would you live out your final days? Well, folks, I'm here to tell you, we're all living out our final days right now. We may only get today, but I'm, I'm still going to buy a lot of ticket, okay, <laughs> after this. I'm feeling lucky. Task number four, finally, and I know that's the word you've all been looking for here, finally. I want to challenge you as WWU alumnus to maintain a strong connection with this university and this family. Many of those that have gone before you, over 100,000 of us, have never forgotten Western and stay involved, helping keep Western one of, if not the most, premier universities in the United States. I'm proud of this place, and you should be too. I want you to give it up right now for all the Western faculty, staff, and supporters who helped make your dream come true. Okay, as Media Past President of the Alumni Association, I'm gonna give a shameless plug here. I want you to buy a brick. I want you to buy a license plate. I want you to mentor a student. I want you to join the Alumni Association. And I want you to keep in, in touch with your staff and your mentors and your professors. We wanna hear about your successes, your failures, and most importantly, the ways in which you change the lives of others. Graduates, I challenge you to be heroes. Go ahead and fail every once in a while. Live it like you mean it, and don't become strangers. Congratulations, and let the partying begin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Boyd, and thank you also for not checking the seating capacity of this room. 